Welcome back to the show. I'm Fateen, speaking to the issues shaping our nation. And today, we're talking about Canada's economy and how each one of us can navigate today while also preparing for the future with financial security advisor, Jonathan Lewis. When it comes to our national finances and our economy, Canadians are literally facing realities never before seen by any generation here. According to Statistics Canada, in January of this year, inflation surpassed 5% for the first time in 30 years, not including gasoline, which has seen the highest inflation rates, with some areas of the nation increasing 50 cents per litre over the past year. The Consumer Price Index increased 4.3%, translation, almost everything on the shelves has gotten noticeably more expensive. Canadians are feeling it, particularly when it comes to food, utilities, and gasoline, all of which are essential items. On housing, Royal LePage's latest house price survey found the average price for a home in Canada increased 17.1% between the fourth quarters of 2020 and 2021. The average home price is now hitting under just under $800,000. Most analysts agree that prices across Canada are set to keep rising through 2022, even if interest rates rise. Shelter costs in general rose 6.2% year over year from January 2021 to 2022. The fact fastest pace since February 1990. Both payroll taxes, CPC and EI, went up this year, meaning increased costs to employees and employers, making it difficult for employers to increase wages for their employees. And another carbon tax increase is here as of April, which is expected to drive up gas prices even more. Most of this is all hitting low-income families the hardest, which is why the Senate has introduced S-233, an act to require the Minister of Finance to develop a national framework to provide all persons over the the age of 17 in Canada with access to a guaranteed livable basic income. Advocates for this approach say it will help low-income Canadians keep their heads above water. Critics say it will discourage people from working in a market where some employers are already having a hard time finding help. It could also increase taxes in the long run, driving more Canadians below the poverty lines. Last but not least, the federal debt has now reached $1.2 trillion, twice of what it was only two years ago. Practically, this will likely mean even higher taxes down the line, as each Canadian now owes between $45,000 and $50,000 on the federal and debt portions combined. Well, this is all quite discouraging if we we're to be honest, but the reason I keep bringing this information to you is because being honest with where our nation is at in our economic health measurements is critical to each one of us so we can know how to speak to our elected officials, encouraging them to do everything that they can to get things moving in a better direction. It also helps us know how to vote with wisdom and also helps us know how to plan for ourselves and our families. Well, with me today to talk about just that is Jonathan Lewis, partner, president and financial security advisor of Eastport Financial Group. He and his accomplished group coach people towards fiscal freedom and health, while also being a strong advocate for the power of entrepreneurialism to change lives and communities for the better. He and his wife, Sarah, uh, have many irons in the fire serving with nonprofits and investing in an average of two to three business startups at any given time. I'm looking forward to this conversation with Jonathan. So without any further delay, let's get to it. Well, I am really looking forward to this conversation today. Welcome to the show, Jonathan Lewis, partner, president, and financial advisor in the beautiful province of Nova Scotia at Eastport uh, Financial. Thanks for joining me today, Jonathan. Thank you, Faitin. I'm really happy to be here. Well, you are a first-time guest uh, for us, for our viewers. And so why don't you just take a minute to uh, just introduce yourself, what you do, and how you got involved in this line of work of helping Canadians just stay on track when it comes to their finances, particularly at this crazy time we find ourselves in. Yeah, I, uh, I'm a 22-year uh, vet in financial services. Remember, my my father passed away. Uh, a lot of people know this. I've, I've been interviewed a number of times about fatherlessness, and I've written a book on it. And when he passed away, my mom uh, found a way to a, a broker who was just a wonderful man who specialized in taking care of widows and 
Um, Nick was his name, and, and I had the privilege of job shadowing him for a day in high school. And I've always been a numbers guy. I've, you know, math is is not a struggle in our household for any of us. My my daughters and I have competitions with calculators to see who can do the math quicker than the calculator. And uh, but I job shadowed Nick for a day in high school, and and realized there was something very noble about what he was doing for my mom. And it's not something we hear about really uh, at all. And and let's face it, um, you know, the, the financial services industry does not have a good reputation. So I didn't have any uh, preconceived ideas to sort of pollute my idea of what it meant to be an advisor. I just had that one day where I saw this man um, loving my mother and really giving her good counsel and advice in the wake of my dad's death. And so um, I, uh, in university, I joined the Canadian Armed Forces and and was really recruited during that season of my life and found my way in financial services. And that was 22 years ago. Um, three years in, managing a, a staff of 18, I started my own investment house. Eastport is, is the company, which was actually my dad's uh, company's name. So anybody who knew my dad knew the Eastport name in Atlantic Canada as a, as a development company. And I kept paying the $75 at the registry to join stock as a teenager to keep that name going. Uh, and that is the name that uh, myself and all my partners and employees now operate under in Canada, coast to coast, um, as a financial services firm. Well, you are not only successful uh, and have an incredible legacy, thank you for sharing that, but you're one of these guys, you know, you don't let a lot of grass grow under your feet, Jonathan. You've written a couple books, you've got your podcast, you and your wife are constantly innovating as entrepreneurs, and you're regularly in contact with the public. So let's just drive right to the elephant in the room right now, Jonathan. So our financials as a nation, you know, probably the, wor the worst balance sheet we've ever had in the history of our nation, right? The highest inflation levels, cost of living at an all-time high for our generation. And yeah, people are just yeah. really grappling with even how to navigate. Like, what are you hearing from your clients and the people that you interact with in the day-to-day -day on, on what their main concerns are in reference to financial health? You know, the market is very emotional. Warren Buffett is no, like notorious for saying uh, the market's 50% emotions and 50% science. And uh, but the emotions will always overrule the science in the early days. And so right now we spend a lot of time with our clients, obviously educating them, counseling them. Um, you know, our clients are very calm. We've uh, uh, we've realized a long time ago, the time you spend with your clients pays off in dividends when you're in a, a season like this. And I've been through 9-11 professionally, 2008 professionally, 2013, 2018, and now this. Um, so, you know, one thing we're very confident of is there's always buying opportunities. There's always opportunity in the environment. Uh, so we try and remind our clients of that and reassure them. Um, it doesn't change the fact that if you've got retirees and they're the ones that I spend the most time praying for and really thinking about and contemplating the moving dynamics for them, they need a monthly check every month. And it doesn't matter if the market is up or down. I still have to come good and make sure they get their annuitized payments from their RIFs and, and their payments. So to be honest, advisors really earn their keep in choppy and down markets because we have to spend a lot more time uh, with our clients, holding their hand and reassuring them and, and reminding them that on the whole, the market always trends upwards. What I can say about this season uh, and this is always the case with the markets and with, with the economies, is the markets are a voting machine and they love certainty and they do not like uncertainty. And what we have right now is a lot of uncertainty that is um, existential or it's, it's beyond anybody's control. But we have a lot of uncertainty that's been manifested unnecessarily. And um, I know that that's what we really have a hard time navigating is how do we um, you know, knowing we have to invest, you know, 70, 60 percent of our clients money in Canada. How do we um, manage our way through this for our clients uh, at the micro level when we're dealing with so much micro instability that that isn't necessarily what the rest of the world is dealing with? So that's that's been a struggle. 
Absolutely. And obviously, we just came through a, an unprecedented situation with our prime minister invoking the Emergencies Act, mm -hmm. uh, freezing yeah. the bank accounts of Canadians. You talk about uh, unpredictability <laughs> in the market. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, how did you guys respond uh, with that whole dynamic? And what did you observe with, with Canadians at yeah, that point? Like, like everybody, there's an old saying in my business, uh, when the tide goes out, we get to see who has a bathing suit on and who doesn't. And, and certainly that emergency act, people just didn't see that coming. Um, that was um, extreme. And uh, I'm not going to comment on it was extreme in my opinion. I'm going to comment purely on how does the market respond to that kind of uncertainty? Uh, the only thing that I care about is, well, what does this do for my clients' prospects of acquiring and growing their wealth for retirement? And, and is it a short-term shock or a long-term shock? So first of all, it's a shock. Um, so you know, we have not seen that kind of um, government strong handedness in the, in the context of what that would do to, uh, to, to investors. And, and we've seen since 2015 a, a gradual um, um, uh, pullback of foreign investment in our country. It's, it was 4% from 2015 to 2019. Now it's double digits. And the last two weeks have been um, rocky. Um, and there's these other shock factors like, um, Ukraine and Russia, you know, a lot of people didn't think Ukraine was going to get invaded. And, you know, the markets are responding to that now because, again, it's uncertainty. But um, we all know that oil and gas prices are huge drivers on inflation. So it's like, OK, how do we slow down this inflation? And if there's not too many levers left that you can pull, you know, you can very well find yourself in a similar environment that we saw from the uh, late 1970s into the mid and late 1980s, where inflation is hard to manage and every country is trying to figure out how to do that. We love Canada and we wanna see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference, and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today. Uh, what I love about you, Jonathan, is you are a sharp pencil. You are excellent in your field, uh, but you're also a man of prayer and a man of faith. And uh, yeah. and you've yeah. studied your, your, your vocation out through that lens as well. Let me ask you this, Jonathan, for our viewers, are there timeless principles? Like when the world is just going like this, it's so unpredictable, whether it's the, yeah. the Emergencies Act, the wars, yeah. inflation. Yeah. What yeah. are the things that Canadians could be doing and should be doing just to create stability? You know, I'll never forget Ron Blue, and people may or may not know who Ron Blue is. Certainly your U.S. audience would. Um, I'll never forget Ron held up a Wall Street Journal um, in front of me in a discussion we were having with a small group. And then he um, took the Bible, and he took the Wall Street Journal, and he opened the Bible, and he put the Wall Street Journal on the Bible. And he said, this is the most up-to-date knowledge and information that we have about world markets today. And then he said, but this is thousands of years of timeless wisdom about money and where our heart should be around it. And what I've learned is that you can try and forecast, but at the end of the day, there's 2,350 passages in the Bible that talks about money. Jesus spent more time talking about money than he did heaven and hell combined. And the reason why is, is he knew that it was a heart issue for us and that we either possessed it or it would possess us. I am charged with the responsibility of managing people's wealth. But what I really realize I'm charged with is managing their hearts around their wealth and helping them to realize that this will ultimately fail them or pass away. And our job is to do as good a job as we can together um, to manage their retirement, manage their expectations, help them to achieve their goals, but ultimately realize um, we, we can't take this with us. But if, if their heart is right towards money and they realize it's a tool that we can use to improve the world around us, not just our own lives, but the lives of so many others, if we can be generous, um, uh, they can live a really fulfilling life and it doesn't actually matter how much of it they have. And I've seen that. I've seen that in people that have a lot and don't have a lot because they're not attached to it. 
Well, that that is a good word. <laughs> just read the red letters, right, of the Gospels, and uh, everything you just shared there will be reinforced. We're not taking any of it with us. So, um, you know, I want to ask about this. I, I remember a few years ago listening to a, a Jewish commentator it was fascinating, and he talked about how in the Jewish culture they they teach their children from a very young age fiscal principles. And he talked about five jars, the five jar principle where, you know, 10% mm. goes to the tithe and 15% goes to investments. And I, I don't remember the, the whole breakdown, but it was something like yeah. uh, challenging people to live on only 55% of their annual in, or their total income. And yet mm -hmm. you, you, you weigh those types of principles up against, um, the analytics of our time where before COVID-19, the average Canadian was only $200 away from insolvency. Um, what do you say to that person that just wants to get started yeah. in yeah. stewarding their income with wisdom uh, in, in a situation where it, it, for a lot of people, it's, it's super tight? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was there um, after my dad died. I went through some very, very physically difficult years. Um, and I've had other events in my life that have left me uh, paycheck to paycheck. So I know that feeling. Um, so when I say this, um, uh, it is definitely coming from a place of experience and not, um, well, I've never been there, so or he's never been there, so he doesn't really appreciate what it feels like. And uh, what you're describing is, uh, we call it uh, the pie graph of, of money. And there's, there's five places you can put it. Uh, three of them are the save it, spend it, leave it. Uh, but there's also taxes and debt. And it's really, really simple. If you have a lot of debt, and, and let's face it, in North America, it's consumer debt that gets away from us. And we get those credit cards that get away from us. And Dave Ramsey's done a tremendous job of, of trying to help people with uh, snowballing their debt. But the trick is to say, okay, I've got my personal debt. And then I also have my share taxes of federal provincial debt. That's all debt. It's just your macro debt or your debt that you share with other Canadians, and then there's your personal debt. So what I've observed is that if you can manage your personal debt down to zero, and that takes discipline, and to be blunt, you need an accountability partner. I have a financial planner that I'm accountable to, and I sit down with him twice a year, and I bear all my cards and say, yeah, this was not responsible spending. So if I need to have accountability, we all do. And uh, But I... I, I uh, I'm very deliberate with my clients and myself to say, okay, no personal debt, pay off your debt, pay off your mortgage, um, uh, try and retire the debt. The big one is consumer debt. Avoid consumer debt and credit card debt at all costs. You will be a slave to the lender, as God's word says, uh, if, you get, uh, if it gets away from you. Then what happens is you can save and, or, uh, and, and also give. And what people fail to see is when the tap on debt turns off, and you start turning up the tap of giving and saving, well, there's tax incentives for both of those in our country still. Now, there's talk about changing that, where you might not get a tax receipt for giving. So give while you can. And so, yes, 50% goes towards living. It's almost uh, without fail. I've seen it swing between 56 and 47%. There's some people that do what's called re reverse tithing. Um, it's certainly something my wife and I have high on our radar that we're working towards to actually give way more than the tithe. I talk about that actually in my new book, um, Giving Beyond the Tithe. And, um, and what I would say is if you can really discipline yourself to not have any debt, start giving and saving, then your taxes start to drop and you find yourself all of a sudden with surplus. And it's, it's crazy because it's almost like you're just taking the hose out of one bucket, getting it into another bucket. And it really is that simple. Well, well, that's powerful and such a good reminder. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Let me ask one more question. Then I'm going to switch tracks um, altogether and just talk about how yeah. how you're how you've been managing your your team through this uh, wild time called COVID nineteen. But um, mm -hmm. to the point on debt, is there such a thing as good debt to to leverage you into uh, another financial tier, or is it just is debt bad all the time? In your opinion, you can invest to make money. The trick is. If you're leveraged, whether it's to buy real estate or even your house or what have you, or to start a business, I mean, all my clients for the most part are business owners. So they all have operating lines. They have debt to run their businesses. So it's normal. The, the number one trick biblically is you need to be in a position to be able to pay back that debt. You have to have liquidity to pay it back. If you're not liquid enough to be able to pay it back, you shouldn't be carrying the debt. So 
I'm a big fan of using leverage to make money, but I'm always in a position where I could wipe out all of my debt if I had to. And that is um, very much biblically supported. Uh, that said, the Bible also says, if you can, at all costs, avoid it. Um, so in our world today, that's very challenging. Um, if you're running a $100 million business and you have a $5 million payroll, um, you could have $20 million of receivables on the books and still only have a million dollars in your bank account. Well, you still have to pay your employees this week, right? So, so it's not to say that you're not liquid. It's just you need liquidity. And so uh, I always stress to people, there's a big, big difference between liquidity for the sake of, of continuity in your business versus uh, debt that you are not able to pay back. Well, that's an important distinction. Thank you so much yeah. for that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. let's talk about your business. You have a really neat testimony, 18 employees. And yeah. how did you manage through all the dynamics of wear a mask, don't wear a mask, get a vax yeah. passport, don't get a vax? How are you guys doing on that one? Uh, it wasn't easy. Um, it was stressful. I was, uh, I've was i been um, part of tech and uh, EO and KCO forums and different um, peer groups with CEOs. And I can remember when this first came up in June about um, forced vaccinations. And um, uh, someone in one of my groups said, you know, well, we're just going to have to force all our employees to get vaccinated. And, and something in my heart just um, shook. And um, I didn't really have a position on the vaccine one way or, or the other. What I was concerned about was that, that word force. And so within my own company, um, as obviously the, the narrative went on, and it was obvious that I was uh, very much not in, in the, uh, uh, the popular vote, I thought, okay, I just have to be a good steward of what God's entrusted me with. And what he's entrusted me with is these people and their families and then the families that we support. And so we kept doing rapid antigen tests uh, at Eastport. Um, um, and uh, we actually had one employee uh, uh, with an extended family member who had a bit of a, a, a bad reaction, uh, which uh, interestingly enough brought us all together in concern for that person. And so through the whole thing, I, I really almost felt like the hand of God was just on my company and that he was just almost sparing us. He knew our hearts. And for me, I sit here and go, man, I would put the culture of my team up against any company in this country right now. They would kill for each other because we've just walked through, uh, like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, we just walked through a fiery furnace together. And we know, ironically, Christian or non-Christian in my shop, everybody knows there's something special about eSport. Um, so yeah, unity was not about conformity. It was about, we want to do this together. Powerful. It's so inspiring, Jonathan. It sounds like you got a book on that one, even if it's a, <laughs> if it's a mini book, just to share your testimony and a, bu a bunch of podcasts. Anyway, just to clarify, when you said that one of your team members or their family members, and correct me if I'm wrong, had a, um, a, a negative reaction, was that to the antigen test or to the vaccine? That was to the vaccine. Yeah. And it was interesting because it was right at the time when we were really getting heated, like everybody about, about this. And I was praying hard. I was like, Lord, I need your help. Uh, I want to lead and I want to lead the way you want me to lead. And, um, and then interestingly enough, an extended family member, a, a report came in that there was a bad uh, reaction. And, but for our group, it, it brought us to a place where we took stock and we were like, okay, wait a minute, let's just let everybody navigate this the best that way that they know how. We, we all want to do the right thing for each other, but let's not uh, get to the place where people are hurting themselves to prevent other people from getting hurt. Like something's not right about this. Surely there's better ways that we can navigate this to protect everybody. And that's what we chose to do. I mean, it was, ma we, we wore masks. Um, you know, clients came in and they were, they were nervous. Everybody masked up. Um, you know, my unvaxxed employees did rapid antigen tests Mondays and Wednesdays. It cost me thousands of dollars to buy these rapid antigen tests before the government started providing them to us. And I don't know when it was January. I'd, I'd had them since September. I'm thinking, man, this is, this is like, this is the body of Christ. And, um, and it's right before my eyes in a, a, a business. And I said to one of my employees, this is marketplace ministry. Like, like not only are we witnessing and serving our clients, but we're serving each other and it's powerful. And if you interviewed any one of my employees, I know they would, they would say, 
best place ever to be. And, and it's because I'm an employee too. Like to me, uh, God is my CEO. It's his company. I just need to uh, be a good steward of what he's entrusted me with. Wow. Well, this is so powerful. So beautiful. Seriously, Jonathan, I love how you respect uh, your employees, respect their conscience, freedom, rights, and have cultivated such a beautiful uh, culture of unity. So good on you. That's amazing. Now, my only regret, Jonathan, is that our time is starting to run out here, but uh, you've got a couple books and obviously yeah. your, your business has a website. Why don't you rattle off where people can find you? Sure. You can check uh, our family out at the Jonathan David Wayne Lewis Foundation, or you can just Google the Lewis Foundation. All my books are on Amazon. My most recent book is More Than Money. Um, and um, I've been told that it is a, 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 a tough and convicting read, which doesn't surprise me because it's certainly where, where I felt the spirit leading me in writing it. Um, and, uh, and certainly you can check us out at esportfinancialgroup.com uh, if you want to. And uh, yeah, we, we just want to try and be a good example of marketplace ministry uh, in Canada. Amazing. Well, hey, may there be way more like you uh, emerging in the future. This has been so inspiring. Jonathan, any final words for our Canadian viewers right now? Oh, man, just remember either you possess money or it possesses you. But like Jesus said, you can only have one master. Uh, and at a time like this, we can really get worried about what's going on in the world around us, or we can just trust that master and know that he's firmly seated on the throne of our lives. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jonathan. My pleasure. And thank you to you for joining with me this week. I never take it for granted that you would spend a chunk of your day with me. So just want you to know how much I appreciate it. If you want to watch the show again, if you appreciated the content, uh, super easy. You can just go to fateen.tv where this show is posted as well as other previous episodes. You can share it with your family and friends from that website as well. Or, and you can also download our free iPhone app, get on our email list, and you will never miss a show uh, or an alert of a show if you do. Also want to give... A wholehearted uh, shout out to our friends, our donors, our monthly partners. We always say it because it's so true. We could not keep at it without you. You are the ones that keep us on air every single week. We're going up on about three years now. Can you believe it? Uh, because of you and your generous support. So thank you. If you would like to become a monthly partner or give a special donation today, every gift makes a huge difference and is deeply appreciated. All you need to do is go to fateen.tv or give us a call at one 866-844-0844 and our team would be delighted to speak with you, to pray for you and answer any questions that you have. Thanks again for joining me. Hope to see you next week. Prayer is undeniably one of the most powerful forces in the universe. It has the power to reach through walls, across regions, and into the hardest of situations to bring change. It has the power to save lives. That is why we're committed to raising up 24-7 prayer for our nation. Through the Justice Wall, you can sign up for a 15-minute prayer slot every week to pray for life in Canada, to pray for an end to human trafficking, and for godly government in every region of our nation. Sign up for one or many weekly prayer times. You'll even be given weekly reminders and prayer directives if you want them. Visit www.justicewall.com to sign up for your time and join with believers from sea to sea who are standing on guard for our nation every week through prayer www.justicewall.com